presentation is uh, for uh, the design of uh, graphene oxide materials for uh, supercapacitors by uh, Donovan, Bryce, Albin, and Andrade. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So as mentioned, uh, we're presenting our fourth year design project on the design of graphene oxide materials for supercapacitors. So what we're, what I'm, what we're gonna talk about today is a brief introduction to supercapacitors and the cri critical parameters what we thought that were uh, critical to the design of our supercapacitor. And then we're gonna dive into our project, the scope of it, our design philosophy, what we did, the tests we ran, and the results we got. Then we'll, that's essentially our first design cycle, and then we'll look at uh, analyzing the results, drawing conclusions, and making uh, remarks on the future outlook of where we think we can go. So why supercapacitors? Why do we care about supercapacitors? The main advantage of a supercapacitor is its ability to rapidly charge and discharge. So if you can imagine having uh, a supercapacitor in your phone where you only need to be tethered for five, 20 seconds at a time and be able to run for three, four hours. It'd be much better than having to tether yourself to the wall for about an hour just to get, you know, about a two hour charge. Although that's improving these days. So looking at the Nyquist plot here, we can see that electrochemical capacitors or supercapacitors lie in the regime between energy density and power density between electrolytic capacitors and batteries. So this is what we're targeting. Now I want to point out the fact that batteries rely on electrochemical, uh, or electrochemical reactions uh, for the energy density part. Electrochemical capacitors can also rely on electrochemical reactions, but they're a lot faster and highly reversible. So our main disadvantage here is the relatively low energy density. So then the important question is how do we improve the energy density? So we found that there were three critical factors that we needed to look at. The first is the charge storage mechanism. The second is the, uh, is the setup of the cell. And the third is the electrolyte. So I want to draw your attention to the equation here. E is equal to half CV squared. What does that tell us as upcoming engineers? We have two parameters to play with, the capacitance and the voltage. So the first thing that I mentioned was charge storage mechanism. And this directly affects the C value. So we have the electrochemical double layer capacitance as well as pseudocapacitance. These are the two mechanisms of charge storage that we're looking at. The, electro, the EDL capacitance is quite simply your parallel plate capacitance, except instead of having uh, two metal parallel plates, the charge is stored between the electrode and electrolyte interface in what we call the double layer. The pseudocapacitance more resembles a battery where you actually have electrochemical reactions or a redox reaction. But these reactions are highly reversible and uh, very rapid in nature. So the next two deal with voltage. So as I said, there are two ways to set up the cell. There's a symmetric setup and there's the asymmetric setup. In our design, we decided to go for asymmetric because as you can see from inset B here, you can greatly expand the voltage window. And why is that? The critical reason for that is that the electrodes have different failure mechanisms. In the positive regime, you run into a reaction called oxygen evolution reaction. In the negative regime, you run into the oxygen reduction reaction. We want to avoid these because this will rapidly degrade our supercapacitor. So it is well known that manganese oxide is a great material for delaying the onset of OER, and activated carbons are uh, good materials for delaying the onset of ORR. So as you can see, you can get an effective voltage window twice that of what you can get from a symmetric capacitor. Of course, the advantage there of the symmetric capacitor is that it's easier to assemble. So then the third aspect, controlling voltage, would be the electrolyte. <coughs> Sorry. Oh. Yeah. There are three systems that are widely researched. There's the ionic electrolyte, there's organic electrolyte, and there's aqueous. The first two carry the advantage of operating at a higher voltage, so three and four volts typically. However, these come with the trade-offs of instability as well as toxicity. So again, we had to decide what do we want, higher voltage window or 
simplicity. We opted for simplicity, and that's why we went with aqueous electrolyte, because it's safe, stable, and easy to use. So now I'll be briefly going over our project scope and what we attempted to do during this design project. So when we first came to this project, we identified what a customer would want in a first generation supercapacitor. We identified that they would want a, a energy density of about 20 watt, hour, watt hours per kilogram as a first generation as a proof of principle. We looked for a suitable power density, that means these materials would fully charge and discharge in 30 seconds, and we looked for it to be stable over 50,000 cycles, giving approximately 400 hours of device operational time. So in order to achieve this, we stuck with the design philosophy of the three S's, so safe, simple, and stable, So, and how we incorporated that into an aqueous asymmetric supercapacitor is because we have the three components, the anode, the electrolyte, and the cathode, we decided to simplify things and go with well-known materials for both the anode and electrolyte and keep things safe and simple there. The main design issues we encountered were in the creation of our cathode materials with the graphene and manganese dioxide materials. These materials are effectively pseudocapacitive materials and we can design them in, through the fabrication process to reduce the aggregation and to improve the simple fabrication, keeping one pot uh, synthesis techniques in mind to maximize the safety. And now, so for our first design cycle, to give you an idea what this fabrication looks like, and this is the favorite part of my design, is that we are able to use a simple microwave oven to make our nanomaterials. And what's affected by this is the graphene and graphene oxide readily absorb the microwave radiation so we can locally heat our nanoparticles and deliver the energy directly to the reaction. And so uh, systems like this have been proposed, but what we tr played around with in our design was directly reacting and reducing the graphene oxide and the metal nanoparticles in one simple step in our first design iteration. We found at the first time that this approach failed because we did not have enough a sacrificial reductive material inside the reaction. So it's more simply put, we didn't have enough electrons in the reaction environment for our materials to steal and become reduced. So that's why we moved on to our, a more novel addition of polyvinyl alcohol to the system. So the polyvinyl alcohol allowed us to do two things. It, when we added it to the geo, it surface absorbs and prevents the aggregation. This allows us to pre-reduce using a hydrogen hydrate solution to produce the RGO directly instead of the one pot synthesis. And then when we put it in, to our reaction in our microwave, it provides the electrons needed to do the reaction on the metal oxide to form a bernesite manganese dioxide. And we want to stress that it's the bernesite, because in literature we find that this bernesite has the pseudocapacitance that is superior to all other forms. And this is how we characterize to know that we've achieved the bernesite. So once we do XRD, we fingerprint our crystal, and once we remove our aluminum background, we can see that the spectra that remain closely resemble the bernesite crystal that we are trying to form. And I'll just quickly run through the anode design that I said we just simplified. We used a polyaniline precursor, and, which is a conductive hydrocarbon, and then we carbonize it, and we activate it, and activating just simply means we expand it. And a few design issues we ran into is keeping in the emeraldine salt before carbonizing it and expanding it. And also the first recipe that we used to make this did not produce material of sufficient quality, so we had to redesign and go with a different ramp rate and temperature. So now that we have our material synthesis covered, the next thing we need to do is cover the electrochemical performance or characterize it. And we do that through a test called the cyclic photometry. So here we have the CV curve of our graphene manganese dioxide composite. What we found was that it was stable in the voltage window of negative 0.1 to 1 volt. This confirms the fact that we have a good cathode material. You'll note that from the CV curve you can get the specific capacitance, which we calculated to be 48.8 farads per gram, which is pretty high. And keep in mind that this was at a 50 millivolt per second scan rate. This is a very high scan rate, and what is re typically reported in literature is either one or five millivolts per second. That's why you see such high capacitance numbers, is because the capacitance ex increases exponentially as you decrease the scan rate. 
Next is our anode material. Well, what, what, what do you find here? We find that it's stable from negative one to positive 0.2 volts. Again, confirming that we have a good anode material. Notice how rectangular the shape is. That's what we want. That indicates that it's really good at fast charging and discharging. Also notice that the normalized current density on average is four amps per gram. If you do electronics, you know one amp is a lot of current. This is typical for supercapacitive materials. Here we see that the specific capacitance is greater at 75.6 farads per gram, again at 50 millivolts per second. So now that we have the two electrode materials, we have to now put it together into a cell. How do we do that? We used a swage lock cell, which roughly looks like that. In the next slide, I have a picture of our actual setup. And what we need to do is we need to create a so-called electrode sandwich. What that involves us doing is putting the material onto a current collector. In this case, we chose aluminum mesh. And then we do that for both materials and both electrodes, the anode and cathode. In between, we have to put a separator to prevent short circuiting, as well as the electrolyte to carry the charges. We also, uh, we, we encountered quite a few uh, design issues, and I'll point out that this was our uh, main failure mechanism in our project. So yeah, this is what it looks like. It's not a fancy setup, and there's a lot of problems that I can point to. The first is that you need to actually sandwich the, um, you actually need to put quite a bit of pressure in order to sandwich the materials together. And we found that this was a problem. Why? Because our materials are readily dispersible in water. And what are we using as our electrolyte? It's an aqueous electrolyte. So what would happen is as soon as we applied pressure, we would find catastrophic loss of active material getting pretty much splattered within the inside of that cell, reducing our capacitance by quite a bit. So it's no surprise that we run, when we run the CV of that, we only get 1.72 farads per gram and an energy density of 1.87 watt hours per, per kilogram. That's pretty bad. I'm not gonna lie. But what we do see is that we surprisingly got an expanded voltage window of 2.8 volts. That's running into the regime of organic electrolytes. That's unseen. I will point out that there is some redox reactivity at about one volt. But we were able to repeat these constantly, which pointed, that, pointed to uh, the fact that it was actually stable and did not result in rapid degradation of our cell. So now I'll briefly just go over analysis and outlook of what we do with these results here. So in the first design iteration, we've confirmed that we've made this manganese oxide on our graphene substrate well characterized there and that the anode material behaved as expected and properly and well behaved for our supercapacitive material and the electrolyte had no additional design issues and incompatibility with our device. So our main design challenges then remained with the cathode materials. We found that it had very uh, low specific capacitance and our best answer to why that is is because during the formation of our metal oxide nanoparticles, we expect that we degraded the graphene that we were trying to support them on. So that gave a lower conductance. So when we assemble into a larger cell, it has reduced performance. And yeah. So what can we conclude from the results? We found that both synthesized electrode materials had good capacitive behavior. So when we ran the numbers based on those two first CV curves that you saw, we get an energy density that is in excess of 60 watt hours per kilogram. Now the number you see there is the practical energy density. That's important. What that does is it accounts for the, a, a fudge factor to reduce the uh, theoretical capacitance by dividing that number by four to get a so-called practical capacitance. This is commonly done in literature because this accounts for the weight of the current collectors as well as the uh, weight of the encasing and all that stuff at the end of the day. So that's what we should have expected at the end of the day with our cell. So just to reiterate, we know that our cell assembly was the catastrophic failure mechanism in our pro project. We had redispersion of the active material, unwanted redispersion of the active material when imbibing with the electrolyte. So once we put the electrolyte, it would, sp it would spread and applying pressure, it would splatter. When we added PTFE as a binding agent, 
we found that the distribution of the material was much poorer. Also, as you could see from that swage lock cell, we could, there were definitely ohmic losses, significant ohmic losses to our setup. So what can we do about this? This is the important part. We need to know what are our next steps. So as Jeremy mentioned, we could improve the cathode synthesis. How? We outlined that our novel polyol technique could help, could help uh, preserve the integrity of the graphene as well as help form the bernesite uh, manganese dioxide that we want. The other thing that we could do is assemble a coin cell capacitor instead of using a swage lock. We know this would reduce the ohmic losses by quite a bit and it would simplify the process. Finally, there, there is a trade-off that you need to look at with the PTFE binding agent. While it prevents the splattering of the material, you also have to account for the fact that it can reduce the capacitance. So in there, there's a design trade-off that needs to be refined and optimized. And finally, when we can actually get closer to the expected practical energy density, we should perform a conclusive CV curve to validate our theory, as well as perform a constant current charge discharge test to validate the power density. And that's the charging and discharging rate. At this time, we'd like to thank uh, everyone involved, especially our consultant, Dr. Neil McManus, for his advice and recommendations in, during this project. We'd also like to thank Dr. Pope for his assistance and knowledge in making the supercapacitor and access to his labs. I'd like to thank the University of Waterloo for arranging the symposium and giving us time to present here. I'd like to thank also the Petroleum Institute for their in-kind donation of the graphene oxide used in the presentation today. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yeah, I, 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 can, I can run through that. Basically, uh, the swage lock cell was readily available. And the reason why you would first use a swage lock cell is because it, you can easily disassemble it and reuse it constantly. That's the main advantage. Of, uh, that would help with the rapid prototyping, so to speak. Now, as I mentioned, in the first iteration, when we did assemble the cell, we found that once we put the electrolyte on, or the water-based electrolyte, the material would redisperse and essentially get splattered all over the inside. So we had to think about it, and that's where the PTFE binding agent came in. We added PTFE to bind it to make it more hydrophobic so that it wouldn't redisperse. Um, obviously, that, yeah, the, that came with the problem of um, disper dispersion on the uh, current collector itself. So there was much less, uh, it was more of a thick film than a thin film. The answer yeah. at the end of the day is what resources we had available to us, and that's what we had there. And right. the coin cells. The were other thing later. I wanted to point out was yeah, the coin cell capacitor setup was not available to us un until pretty much the last two days before symposium time. Also, the other uh, major uh, consideration there is that the coin cells are more expensive to fabricate because of the m raw material cost of the actual. Uh, enclosure. It's pretty expensive. You mentioned this problem was producing the graph. Would you envisage as a way to make it a, a gentler synthesis? So yeah. Um, so the reason why we think it was very harsh, in order to form the metal oxide compounds, we did it in 3.4 molar KOH, so it's a very basic solution. So that if, in my experience, when we react the graphene in such basic condition, it's liable to degrade. Um, 
when I talked to other people, they found, whoa, you, you degraded it that much. It was unexpected. So in the next design iterations, I'll be dropping down uh, that base because that base is there to ensure that we form our metal oxide crystal properly. So now that we've confirmed that we can make that properly, we can start putting down on that design trade-off and restoring the properties of our graphene. Right, so yeah, just to re-emphasize, that was a design trade-off that we found in the synthesis of the cathode material, was the basicity of the um, potassium hydro, or the basicity of the reaction solution degrading the graphene oxide. Now, we, we wanted to react in a basic solution to get the bernesite form crystal for the pseudocapacitance, um, but with the uh, novel technique of adding the polyol, we think we can definitely reduce yeah. the amount of base we need and to I get think the Bernesite. At the end of the day, we also need to add more polyol because uh, the first iteration the, of the precursors to our reduction agent was very r rough because we don't know the percent yields. So part of the issue I saw that as I imagined a lower percent yield than that we were actually getting, and then we m it may have been that we overproduced what we're looking to do. Okay, any other questions? Otherwise, I'll let's thank the speaker again. If you have any other questions, please see our booth. Yeah, here all day.